So you're at the talk Programming and Math. And my name's Harold Carr. I work for Oracle by way of Sun. And I say that, and I think I mentioned this to a couple of people at lunch. Uh, before when I worked for Sun, people, people go, oh, cool, wow, far out. And then when Oracle acquired Sun, now I work for Oracle. I, now I say, I work for Oracle, and people go, uh. <laughs> <laughs> But notice Oracle's one of the sponsors, so it's, you know, it's got some good people there. Uh, anyway, this uh, talk is, uh, the credits are really about a paper I read called Programming Design by Calculation by uh, Jose Ol Oliveria. How do you say that in Spanish? Yeah. Okay. Right. Por actually, Portuguese, excuse me. Yeah, it's such Portuguese. He teaches at uh, the University of Minho in Portugal. And uh, it's a great paper. I'll have a link to it later. And it really, because I was always re trying to read papers, you know, introduction to category theory and stuff. And I'd always get a little ways into it. And then I'd like, but what does this have to do with programming? You know, show me the meat or the beef or however that is. And uh, so this paper actually got me there a lot quicker. And it, and it motivated me to actually continue looking around. So that's what the idea of this is, is to kind of show you some patterns that uh, occur in functional programming. And there's a lot, lot more. Like if we can make it to the end of this presentation, it makes it up to page 30 of that paper, which is actually 235 pages. It's actually a book. It was meant to be a book. It never got finished, but, but it's still available. So here we go. So we start off with really basic stuff. How do you define a function? So in math, we've all seen that before. This is uh, the uh, factorial function. And it just says there's the two cases. And in Haskell, uh, and I'm not going to assume you know any Haskell, so I'll explain a few things. It says that f is a function from integer to integer. In case f is given a 0, it's going to return 1. And for any other n, it's going to return a recursive call to f with n minus 1 times n. So that's the th it looks pretty much similar to the uh, math definition. And in, in function application in math, you just see f of parentheses x. And in Haskell, the one nice thing about Haskell, the very most important thing in functional programming is applying a function, because that's how you get something done. And so Haskell made the decision to make that almost syntax free. So you just name the function and you give it the arguments. There's no parentheses, there's no commas, there's no curly braces, there's not anything. And I think that was a great decision because uh, it makes it really a compact notation. So uh, let's go on. So the first thing you want to do with functions is compose them. And all this says is given a function, g that takes types a and returns types b, and given a function f that takes input as types from b to c, if you compose them together, then it's a function from a to c. Pretty simple. And in, in math, the notation is this f after g. And in, uh, in a lot of people, that's a little weird to read because you read left to right, so you think f and g. But it's really this way, and because it's because of the way math also does it, is you do g of x and then f of x. So the composition is that little dot in the middle. Uh, in Haskell, the operator for composition is this dot operator, and it says exactly what it says. Given a function f from b to c, and given a function g from a to b, then return a function, and you declare a function by saying backslash x, and that's the argument. And then this is the body, run g of x, and then on the result, run f. So that is function composition. And in Haskell, here's where I've composed, I've, got, I've defined this function c. And it says, given any number a, I'm going to return a number. And what I've done here is first, there's the dot operator. And I'm going to call function times 99. This is another Haskell uh, notation. It's called sections. And it's a partially applied function. So it's 
sum, whatever you give it times 99. So you know the, the times operator takes two arguments, and it's already been given one here. So whatever you give it is going to be times by 99. And then that's going to be followed by whatever the result of that is by plus 10. So that, once again, is pretty. Uh, So C of 1, 109, no big deal. OK, I want to say something first about composition and purity. And I, th I think that's best shown with an example. You know, in Haskell, it's a pure language. So when you call a function with an argument, you're going to get back the same result with the same arguments every single time. If you have something like Java, And uh, I, here's these two functions again. Here's f, which takes an int and returns an int. And here's g, which takes an int and returns an int. And if I call them by first calling g on 1 and then calling uh, f on the result, well, you think I could maybe get the same result. But look what they're really doing. They're actually uh, calling, uh, actually, let me. somewhere we can see it. They're basically doing I.O. And you can't tell that by the function definition. So if you run that, uh, I don't want to have to type it. Okay, you run that, you get something different every time. So that's in, let's look at the same thing in Haskell. First of all, I'm going to take a couple of things off. Because if we want it to look at just like Java, we'll just say, OK, here's two functions. This g function from int to int, and here's f from int to int. And let's try to compile that. GHCI is the Haskell interpreter. So let's say load composition viz purity. And oh, I didn't save it after I made the change. OK. Notice a whole bunch of stuff rolled by. Those are all error messages, which we won't try to figure out what they mean. Because uh, that's actually one of the not so great things about Haskell is deciphering error messages. Uh, what I do in Haskell is I just look at the line number it says and go look. It's in, sometimes I actually read the error messages, but mostly I just see what the line number is and go figure it out. So this is doing the same thing that the, uh, the Java program did, but you have to say I-O int. So actually, when you do a I-O operation, it shows up in the type signature. Uh, for some people, hate that. I particularly like it. It means, particularly if you're on a distributed team and you wake up in the morning and somebody in China has changed one of your interfaces overnight, uh, you're going to know about it. You're going to know if they're doing side effects. And that's like very critical. So now if I uh, run this, you can't, if I run this, you know, I can't do what we've been doing, f of g of, of 3. Uh, no, not in scope. I didn't. Lo I didn't reload it. Okay, so f of g, uh, g after f after g of three. Notice again, it's complaining that it can't match I O of int because it's a whole different structure, and you can run that by way of this thing, and it operates just like Java. I'm not going to get into that. It's like monads and bind, but we're, that's not what this talk is about. But the main point is is everything we're talking about today depends on purity, depends on like when you call it with arguments, you're going to get back the same results for the same argument every time. OK, so the next thing we're going to talk about is composition is associative. And you probably already know this. Uh, and it's very similar to like 
addition or multiplication is associated. So A plus B plus C, doesn't matter which side you do first, it's going to give you the same result. And it's the same thing with associativity. So with this diagram, and there's going to be a lot of diagrams, this diagram is showing that if, let's try the left-hand side first. It says first run H, so H will get me from A to B, and then run the composition F of G, F after G, so that will get me to here. So it, let's try the left-hand side, which says first run G after H, which will get me to here, and then run uh, F, which will get me to D again. So same thing. And what they're all really doing is first running H, then running G, then running F, which if, if you look at the composition, uh, the, uh, the composition as just one thing without any parentheses, it's just a function from A to D. So let's go on to identity functions. And when I say identity functions, because in the Haskell, identity can be, is defined as ID of A to A. And what that means, given any type A, I'm going to return uh, something of that type. And the definition is just ID of given an X returns that X. The interesting thing about an identity function is that it doesn't lose any information. And it's also the unit of composition. And what that means is, it's like in addition, zero is the unit. So if you add uh, n, uh, zero to n, you're going to get n no matter which side you put it on. And it's the same thing. If you compose ID with F on the left or the right, it's the same thing as just running F. And that's shown by this diagram. If you first run ID, it just gives you back the same thing. And then you run F, and you get to B. If you run F first, you get to B, and then you run ID, you get to the same place. So let's see, but a lot of times you see identity saying, well, that's a pretty stupid function. It doesn't do anything. Why would you even use it? And the, the Haskell code I'm going to show you is uh, motivates what you would do with an identity function, which I'm going to probably have to uh, reduce the font a little bit to make make it readable. Let's see, let's call it 24. Can you still read that with the lights down? Okay, so let's go back to top. So let's say in Pascal there's this thing called fold R, meaning fold from the right, and when you're first learning functional programming you'll do a lot of recursion. So you'll do things like length. If to define length, you'll say if it's the empty list, the length is 0. And if it's x cons on to the rest of some list, it's 1 plus the length of the rest of the list. And that's like an explicit recursion. But after a while, you stop kind of writing that stuff and you use like folds, because folds are a way to actually map, not to map, to traverse a list and provide a summary value. So given this de definition of fold, which just says that given a function and that given an A and a B returns a B uh, and some zero element, which is the kind of whatever, it, when there's nothing else left, that's the zero element. If there is no, uh, if there's no elements, just returns zero. If there is an X const on to the rest of a list, then run F with given an x and given the results of fold recursively calling fold r on the rest of the list. So if you have that, you can define flatten of a list as just fold r of, and plus plus means append. So if you, append, if you flatten this list of lists, so you have a list of a list of, of, of integers, so I have a list with just one element, one and two and three, that is the same thing as doing one plus, plus, two, plus, plus, three, and that concatenates them together, and it looks like so flatten zero. So it just flattens them down. Great. Uh, but the nice thing about that, you didn't write explicit recursion. You didn't write flatten by calling itself. It just used, reused fold R, which is a good idea to use fold R as much as possible because there's lots of, compiler knows lots of tricks to do. So now let's say we have this thing called flat map. 
it's another thing which is uh, given a function that given an A returns a list of B, and then given a list of A returns a list of B. So what this says is I given this X, I run G of X on that, and that's going to give me this list of B, but then I'm going to append uh, that list with whatever the accumulator is, which is the rest, the, what the, re the results of traversing the rest of that. So like flat map, what that looks like is if you called flat map with a function given an x returns x times 2 in the <coughs> list, it is just going to do basically this. So 2, 4, 3. So the main point is if you have flat map already defined, then you, instead of defining flatten up here like this, you can define flatten with just, say, flat map of ID. So the, the point, and, and the, the, this is the big point, is a lot of times you'll have a lot of functions that are already doing some pretty interesting things for you. And to, to use those in other places where uh, you can use ID functions so they can do some work for you. And here, let's see how that works. So if I call flat map uh, with ID of this one, two, three, which is it's really going to be a flatten. So it, I replace, and this what I'm doing here is basically equational reasoning, and that just means you're replacing likes with likes. In other words, if this, like you do in, in the algebra, if you say uh, anything in algebra, when you replace something with another equality, it's, a, it's the same value. So the definition of flat map ID is fold R with this function, but with the ID plugged in there, and then the arguments. So now let's do the first step. And that says it is this function given the first element of the list, which is 1. And then the rest is just that same definition. But now we've taken off, and this is the tail of the list. So when you execute this function id of x, uh, that is going to turn into just id of this. The x is now the 1. So I've taken the 1 from here. It was given, uh, given as x in the function. So now it becomes x. And it says plus plus the accumulator. And the accumulator is the result of the recursive call to fold r. So. Uh, Place. Okay, so then I do the next call, which just says ID of 2, uh, and it does the same thing, turns that into a 2, and then it's a recursive call, and ID of 3, and we finally end up with just 1 plus plus 2 plus plus 3 plus plus the empty list, which was the zero element we gave it. So the, the point of that little uh, digression was to say <laughs> ID actually can turn out to be a useful function when used in combination with other higher order functions. OK, constant functions. The opposite, and remember, ID didn't lose any information. A constant function loses all information. And in Haskell, a constant function, there is a thing called const. And it's a function of type a, given an A, and given a B, it returns an A. And what that the definition is, const of x, and it doesn't matter what the second thing is. You don't need to give it a name, so that's what the underscore means. Just return the x. So what the constant function does is lose all information. So here's a constant function, c, uh, and says given any a, it's always going to return uh, a character. So you can say const of the character c, and if you apply that to anything, the, re the resulting function, it's going to be a C. So let's take a look at that. This is kind of the same thing I'm about to get to is, is why is, is, that, is that another really dumb function? It doesn't do anything. Why would you use it? Well, it's the same, same idea as you can use it with higher order functions to get work done. So let's say you've defined length, which I was mentioning earlier. So you can define length ex with explicit recursion by saying length of of the empty list is 0, 
the length of x cons onto the tail of a list is 1 plus the length of the tail of a list. So that's the standard way you do it when you're first learning functional programming. But let's say you have fold left, which is defined this way, so I'm not going to drop down into the definition, just, but it works similar to fold right uh, in terms of what it's going to do for you. It just operates differently. So you can define length now as fold left of const composed with the successor function. So that's pretty cool. Const actually can do something for you. So let's see how that works. This is what it looks like. If you say length of a two element list, then it turns into fold of this composition, const composed with successor of zero. And th so that's the definition, just replaying length. So then when you apply it once, you say it is now, the second call is fold of the same, it's always going to be this is the function that keeps getting passed on and on through every recursive call. And then here's the first application. It says, apply this function, which is the composition of constant successor to zero and A. So when you do the successor function, which is the one that runs first, it turns that zero into a one. And then when you run the const, on 1 and A, it ignores the A, and you have a 1. So now, when you go through for the next element, you say the same thing, const of 1, and it basically just does the same thing. It applies successor to 1, turns that into a 2, ignores the B, returns 2. So same thing about constant functions. They don't seem to do very much, but when used in higher order functions, they can make, and make those higher order functions work for you. And you can kind of look at constant uh, and ID functions as limit points. One doesn't lose any information. Constant function uh, loses all information. And, and then all other functions are going to lose a little bit of inf information. And the, 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 the functional program can be viewed as the art of transformation transforming or losing information to fit a certain context. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a bunch of laws uh, that go along with this. And the idea of this, the rest of this talk is to get you used to thinking, you know, I've, you've, I've heard a million times, programming and math, programming math or category theory, like what does that really mean? And the idea it means just looking at this, as your functions mathematically. And that's what the rest of this talk will do. So constant fusion, the, uh, the, this law called constant fusion just says, given a function f of a to b, and given a constant function, uh, and then given an, uh, excuse me, given that, and given an a, it's just going to return c. In other words, it just ignores the f. So let's look at that in constant fusion. Not constant confusion. Constant. <laughs> which I've, when I've looked at these, these, after a while I get dizzy looking at these arrows because it's going to be those, those diagrams, but they actually do something. So constant fusion, this is a slightly different uh, uh, definition because I wanted to pass in the constant function. But what it says is if given constant fusion, well, here's a, a constant, which C prime is this function up here, which says always, no matter what you give it, always return the, con the character C. And I'm going to compose that with some function f. In this case, the f is just plus 1. So given any number, add 1 to it. So when you run C0, it just returns C. So what constant fusion is saying is that you can just ignore the application of f and just run const directly. Same thing. In other words, here I've given it this plus one function, which does some work and then gets ignored. In this case, it just gets ignored. Uh, this is the same thing. Let's go on because I'm realizing I'm not going to make it through this talk. OK, isomorphisms. Uh, isomorphisms you probably already know about. Uh, it just says that given a function f from a to b, then it has an inverse function uh, from b to a, 
And the law is that if you compose, uh, run F, the in inverse first, and then compose with F, that's the same thing as ID of B. What that means is, first you run this function, so it takes a B to an A, and then you run F, and that takes an A to a B, so you end up back with what you started with. So that's ID of B. And if you do the other uh, composition, first run F, and then the inverse, you get ID of B. And what isomorphisms do, and we do this as programmers all the time. It converts between programs. How many people write JSON on the wire <laughs> based on uh, some d data? That's you're writing some sort of isomorphism from one data structure to another. And object relational uh, mappings, all those kind of things. We, as a matter of fact, I always joke with people like, most of the things that we do as programmers is transform formats. Somewhere, somebody's piece of program is actually doing some calculation, something actually useful. But the rest of the time, we're like, oh, well, I'm taking it off the wire, but now I've got to call this other service, and it needs it in this format, so I transform it to that. And now I've got to call this other thing, and it needs some other format, so I transform it to that. Finally, somebody does something, and then I've got to transform it all the way back out to whatever I told the client I was going to give it. So it turns out uh, doing transformations is pretty ubiquitous. Uh, products. Okay, so products. This is, uh, we were, we've been looking so far at compositions of functions. And composition is where the output of one function matches the input of another function, and you can hook those together. But what if they're not composable? In other words, the outputs are not the same. Well, for products, it's a case where, uh, let's look at this one first. Now let's look at the, the, the Haskell. It says, given an F, which goes from C to A, and given a G going from C to B. In other words, they share the same domain, but they have different codomains. And then given a C, what can you do with it? Well, I'll give you a pair of outputs. And this, this notation with the parentheses here actually means I'm going to give you a tuple. And it's going to have a result type of A and a result of B. And what that looks like is, here's pair definition. Given an F, given a G, and given some C, just execute uh, call F with C, call F a G with C, and return that as a pair. And we're going to use this other notation here in the diagrams, which is the same thing. So these uh, angle brackets means pair, which is a, given a C, return the product of A and B, which in the definition looks pretty much the same. So let's look at products. So there's the definition of pair, which was the one we just had there. And sometimes products or, or uh, pairs are called splits. And uh, transform, where did I see, where did we have transform? I think I went, went to the wrong file. No products. Oh, I know. I forgot something. I, that, when I was talking, I know I forgot. That's why I'm not seeing this. I went, forgot to show one thing for isomorphisms. Okay, so here's isomorphism. We're kept, we said we were uh, transforming data structures. So we have this data structure called a weekday, and it just names the weekday names. And we have this thing called seven, which just has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I have this transform function, which says... Given any sort of thing that's already an enum and it's an ordinal. Uh, ordinal just means it's, you can put it in some order, defined order. And enum just means there's no arguments to any of the, uh, type, uh, the uh, data constructors. So as long as both the arguments are enums and ordinals, given an A, return a B. So first I say from enum, and then I compose it with two enums. So I'm just changing it, whatever enum it is. So Here's a transform. I'm given a Tuesday, and I want to turn it into a 7. So, so if I say I0, you see it does do that. Notice the next one, I0 prime, it says I'm given a weekday, but I want to return a weekday, even though the actual body says the same thing. So if I say I0 prime... 
it gives me a Tuesday, the same thing. And that's because the, you've told it what type you've wanted it. I want a seven in this case. I want a weekday in that case, even though I'm giving it a weekday. And then where we're, you know, and if I want to turn a three into a weekday, then I just actually give a something else to it. So I won. And there's also, uh, uh, let's get the rest of that. So anyway, it's just transforming data from one format to another. So uh, products. Oh, yeah, that's why I went there, products. So this one is saying, given the show function and given the transform function, and transform was the one we just looked at uh, on, the, on the last slide, uh, the last file. And uh, if I run that, it's going to give me, so they both have the same input, and that is, we don't know what it is, it's a C, but it's got to be an enum and an ordinal. It's going to return, in this case, I'm saying it's going to be a seven and a string. So show is Haskell's way to turn any data structure into a string, and transform is what we just saw. So if I say P0 prime, It's one on Sunday. And I just wanted to point out one other thing, because I've defined this pair thing. But in Haskell, there's this uh, package called control.arrow. And it is a way to deal with different kinds of function applications. You know, with most of the function application we're typical used to is just call it, and it returns a result. But when you're working with products and co-products, and another thing called exponentials, which we won't talk about today, uh, you can use the arrows package. So even though I've explicitly defined pair, you can use the arrow package, and it looks like this. Arrow, transform, ampersand, 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 arrow, show. And that does the exact same thing. So if you see p of 1 prime, it returns the same thing. OK. OK, product cancellation. So if you've run that pair of functions, so given a c, run f and g on it, and you get back the pair, product A and B. And if you need to get just one piece of it, you call first or second. No big deal there. Or, you know, it's like a car and cat are in Lisp, or first and second. Uh, there's another piece here called the product of two functions. Uh, so this is one you would use when neither the domains nor the ranges coincide. In other words, you're given something that is a C and a D. So it's a pair of types C and D. And it's going to return the types A and B. So what it does is it, when the function runs, here's the, the definition F times G, is first you take the first element, which is C, and that's what A takes. And then you run F on it. And then you take the second element, you run second on it, and run G on it. And then because it is uh, in a pair, notice it has this pair notation, uh, it returns the product of that. So you come up with an A times B. So that is the product of two functions. Uh, let's go to product. So there's the definition of product. And what this is saying is uh, it's going to take an integer and a string, and I'm returning a string and an integer. So I'm just reversing the arguments. Uh, oh, well, I'm doing more than just swapping arguments. I'm doing something, too. But at the types, I'm swapping the, the types. So what it says is uh, for the one side, I want to first add, I mean, append one to it, because it's given a string, so I want to append one to whatever string I give it. And then I'm calling read. Read is the thing that will turn string representations of Haskell objects into Haskell objects. And then on the other side, I'm saying, given this, the uh, uh, integer, times it by two, and then show it, turn it into a string. Uh, and once again, there's this control arrow, dot arrow notation. Uh, so you actually wouldn't use my definition. You'd use the control dot arrow. But if you load this, 
and say product zero prime, you see it's four and 61. So I've timed two, two by two, but I turned it in, then I've got said show, so it's a string of four. And then this one, I've given the six, I've appended one to it, and then I've read it, turning it into the integer 61. So that is uh, the product of two functions. Okay, next one is product fusion. What this says is that the pair is right distributive with respect to composition. So if I have the pair g of h composed with f, that's the same thing as the pair of first running f and then g and then first running f and then h. So you look at that in this diagram like this. Let's look at the left-hand side first. So here's the f. So let's run it first. So f takes us from d to c. And then you're going to run both g and h on it because they both take c as input, but they return a and b as different outputs. So if you run g and h together, it returns an a times b, which you can tell because c, g goes from c to a, c and the c, uh, h goes from c to b. Uh, so then you, can, then you can look at the right-hand side. Okay, so how does that work? First you do a, first an f and then an h, which is this side. So given that d, you'll get a b. And then the left-hand side, you say first run f, then a g, and you'll get an a. And because it's in this pair, it will turn it back into this product. So let's look, see what that looks like. Okay, so there's the definition of uh, product fusion left and right, which uh, it'd be easier if I could switch back and uh, had them on the same screen. But uh, product fusion left is the pair composed with F, and the right side is the pair of the two compositions, which you can see, the, here's the left, the pair of G and H composed with F, where, and the right-hand side is the pair of the composition of those two. So here's some more equational reasoning, which shows you, if you look at all these things, uh, product fusion left is really just the pair running this pair of times two and show and then the digit to int. So let's first you run digit to int on this digit three, it turns it into a three. And then you say show of three, which gives you the strings three and then the times two of three and that gives you six. That's the left hand side. And if you do a similar thing with the right hand side, you see it's the same thing. So if I actually look at, and say uh, product fusions, they all return the exact same thing. Okay. Okay, here's another thing. Uh, we're not gonna go through this, but there's a thing called times absorption. And what this says, we, the last thing we showed that, that uh, that it was that time, sums are, are right distributive with respect to composition. That's not true about left distribu distributivity, but it does hold when f is the product of two functions. So if f is the product of two functions, then if you get that composed with g and h is the same thing as the pair i composed with g and g composed, j composed with h. Now, one thing, uh, if you really want your programs to be super correct, you really want to know things like, is that really true? I can, you know, it's easy to type that out. Well, actually, it's not that easy. It's, it's hard in LaTeX. <laughs> it's a mess. But uh, you, so what you can do is, uh, is, is uh, some reasoning on it. And that is, given this definition, if you look at the definition of the product of two functions, and replace that, it turns into this. And then if you use that other law we looked at earlier, time, uh, product fusion, it turns into that. And then if you turn, uh, remember that uh, composition is associative, you can move the parentheses around. Once they're moved around, then you can use product cancellation and you end up with the right-hand side. So don't expect 
to anybody to look at that. Although if you go through this paper on your own, there's a bunch of exercises you end up doing things like this, which are pretty fun. Okay, so the product fusion just derived looks like this. If I'm given a C and I run the pair G of H, G and H, it's going to run G, which gives me a D, and H, which gives me an A, and then you're going to have the pair of those. That's what that means. And then I'm going to run the function uh, a time, a, uh, I time, product J, and that is going to run both of these. It's going to run I on D and J on I and give me A and B. So that's all that said, and there's different ways to get about through this diagram. Let's keep moving. Product absorption. I'm going to skip that file because I want to get to co-products. Uh, here's something about uh, products and projections. It says if you're given uh, I and first, that's the same thing as first composed with uh, the product of two functions. And what that means is you don't really need to even evaluate J because you're going to just take first on it so you can skip it. And the same thing says the same thing about uh, J. I'm going to skip past all the rest of these. Uh, this one's actually, yeah, let's go to this one. Reflection just says, to, uh, product reflection, that if you give a pair, but the pair happen to be the functions first and second, it's just like giving ID uh, to it because you're going to take the A, you're going to run first on it, and then you're going to take B, and you're going to run second on this A times B, and then it returns the pair. So it's just uh, a, an identity. And here's another one of those equational reasoning. It says that uh, product is commutative. Uh, and once again, you can go through the uh, derivation of this by using the axioms and the theorems that we've already uh, looked at. What this is really saying is that uh, uh, products are, the, when you swap the fields in a record, it doesn't really mean anything about the information there. It's just in a different order, but no information is lost or gained. And I'm going to skip this and get to coproducts. Okay, so products, if you remember, were when you have functions which take the same type as input but they give two different types as outputs. So they both take an input C, and one gives back an A, and the other one gives back a B. So instead, you, you can run them both, and you get back the pair. What coproducts are is you're given an A or a B, and these are labeled. So it'll say, in, in Haskell, it's convenient to say left or right. So it's either, if it's an A, it'll say it's a left A, and if it's a right, it'll say it's a right B. And then, depending on the, the definition says, if it's a left A, it's going to run the F function. If it's a right, it's going to run the G function. So, and if you look at that, uh, it's similar, right? This one, it's just, you flip these around. So instead of A times B returning a C, it is... A or B returning a C. So the main, the coproducts look very similar to products. So let's go back to that one too, the diagram. Because you have the C, it gives this, and then there's a way to get the elements with first and second. And if you go to this guy, instead you're given a left or a right of A, and then you return a C. So it's just kind of the opposite. Let's see that in Haskell with either. So either is a type, uh, and I'm defining it explicitly, but it's actually in Haskell already. And it says, I'm given a function from A to C, and I'm given a function from B to C, and I'm given an either, an A or a B, and I'm going to return a C. So in the case that I'm given a left A, then I ignore G and just grab F, and I run F of A. And in the case that it's right, then I'm going to ignore the F, grab the G, and then run G of B. And once again, there's arrow notation for this. So if you load either, and you look like at E0, 
and E1 and E2, they're all going to return to E2. Going to return the same thing. So what this is saying is if I'm given a left, then I'm going to take this value that's in left and times it by 11. If I'm given a right, I'm going to take the value and add 1 to it. And the uh, arrow notation is just the same thing we've seen before where it says arrow and then or, or, or. It's kind of like in, uh, reminiscent of or, which because it either is or. So, okay, so that's uh, the either part. So the thing about co products, yes? Oh, okay, okay. Five minutes. Uh, products and co-products are, are uh, dual, meaning anything you say about one can be said to the other. So I'm going to rush through this. Uh, I'm not going to actually drop anything, but this has the same thing. Remember we saw a product of two functions. So this says uh, it is the sum of two functions. And what that says is if I'm given a A or a C, then I'm going to run either F or G on it. And when I'm done running it, I'm going to label it, the result. with if, I, if it was an F, it's going to be labeled with an, a left. And if it's a right, it will be labeled with right. So that's very similar to what we saw a moment ago, where we said, given a product of these things, I'm going to run them. Actually, it's going to run both of them and give me a different type. OK, cancellation. Uh, and that says, given a left composed with the sum of two functions, the, the, uh, the sum of two functions, it's the same thing of just doing G. In other words, you don't really even need to because you've already labeled it. What that says is given some value A, and where it says I1, that really should say left, and this should say right, uh, then it's going to be, you run G or H, and you'll come with, with C. So if you go look at the product, it looks like the same thing, but in reverse. And then we have the same thing with uh, uh, some reflection that says if, they're, if you give left and right uh, as the functions to, uh, to the either, then if it's an A, then it's just going to turn back into A, left of A. If it's a left of B, it's going to turn back into a left of B. So it's the same thing as ID of A or B, which looks like this in reverse. That's the, that's the product reflection. It, there's the same fusion type of thing where it says on the left-hand side, if I run the, the either of G and H, so if I'm given a, le, a, a left, an A or a B, excuse me, and run it through the either the sum of GH, I'm going to get back a C, and then I run F. And I can also run it by saying, no, instead, I'm going to just run, if it's a B, I'm going to run F of H. And if it's a uh, A, I'm going to run uh, F after G. So that looks very similar to that diagram, but the arrows are, end up in reverse. Uh, there's product uh, su sum absorption. And there's functors. Sorry about this diagram, but uh, I ran out of time turning it into a, a, a beautiful diagram, so it's just the, the, the uh, hand-drawn one. Uh, but it says the same thing. I'm going to end up here. So there's this mixing products and co-products, which says that if you have a co-product, A or B, you can tune it into a product, A prime times B prime. Uh, so let's skip the actual definition of that. and end because uh, we want to eat lunch and I'm out of time. But so some of the things that I've talked about is purity. All this stuff works because there's no side effects. And Haskell's great that way because if there is a side effect, you can't even use the composition operator. And the fact that there's side effects is in the type signature. So we've talked about various ways to apply functions and compose them, and not just compose them when their outputs match in, with inputs but products and co-products. The products were the ones where they both take the same input but give different outputs. And the co-products are where they, uh, that's co-products, yeah, where they, uh, uh, <laughs> where they take a left or a right, and then they're going to run one to the other and then give you that output. We showed a little bit of equational reasoning. When you have this type of information, 
you can actually reason about your programs by, by saying, here's what it looks like. I replace it with the definition. I run that function and replace it by the value. And you end up with some very powerful ways to think about your program. And then this basically showed you a lot of very interesting patterns. And that's what kind of like, you. if you hear about category theory, uh, when I've looked at category theory, it gets, it stays so abstract that it takes me a while to relate it to programming. When I found this paper, I went, oh, OK, I can actually relate that to programming now. But now I'm actually feeling more confident that I could go to category theory and actually dive in a little deeper. There's lots more in the paper, which this is the full uh, link to the paper. And where we made it to was page 30 of 285 pages. So you've all got your work cut out for you because it's uh, pretty interesting reading and it's got lots of exercises. And if you want the code and the slides, it's right there at this uh, bit.ly link. Uh, bit.ly is 2015-lambda-conf-herald-car. And it has all the Haskell code and the slides and uh, yeah, that's it. And, but that, that paper, I really recommend going and getting that paper and, and running through it. It's a great paper. Thank you. Any questions?